Hello, Warriors. It's Dr. Z and Dr. C coming at you with a special episode, timely episode, I would say, Dr. Callahan. Yeah, I'm excited to get into this one. We usually have a format with different parts, but this is just going to be an interview. It's sort of a mini episode, but we thought it would be important to get a patient perspective on COVID. So what we have for you guys today is sort of the memoirs of a patient that lived through fighting coronavirus with sickle cell disease, an individual who not only is a patient, a warrior, but also a sickle cell disease caregiver. She's going to drop some bombs of knowledge on our warriors about what to expect, what to think about, what to worry about, what to not worry about. Hopefully these guys will enjoy it. Let's get to it. All right, Warriors, we have a really, really special guest here with us today who is not only a sickle cell patient, a sickle cell warrior, but she's also a sickle cell caregiver. And she has a really unique perspective to share with us in these crazy times of coronavirus because Latoria, Miss Latoria Brown, had COVID-19 herself. And she's going to share a little bit of her experience with us today. Thank you so much for joining us, Latoria. No problem, Dr. Z. We're so excited to have you on. We do a lot of uh, podcasts, but we don't always get a chance to talk with patients and it's for patients. And I think people with sickle cell get so much out of talking to other people and hearing other people with sickle cell stories. So thank you so much for joining us today. So when when did you start coming down with COVID symptoms? When did you notice? I cannot say exactly when I or how I got it, but I do remember the day that I brought Deontay to Children's on the 11th for his appointment. Like I say, I can't say for sure this is where I got it from, but as we were leaving, Deontay was a little ways behind me. As I was bypassing a person, we hadn't even crossed past each other. He coughed and I looked and I'm like, oh, you know, cover your mouth, you know? (laughs) But it was like coming my way. So as we left that day, I was okay. The next day I started, you know, running a fever. So the first thing you noticed was you had a fever. I did. I had a, um, a fever and my chest started hurting. And I said, oh, I hope I did not catch pneumonia being out here in, the, in this weather because it was, had been nice outside. Even though it was nice, I still had on, you know, a jacket and a shirt because I know it's so easy for sicklers to get sick in that type of weather. When I started running a fever, I said, I'm gonna go to the doctor. And they told me I had an upper respiratory infection, which was pneumonia, but they didn't treat it. They didn't give me anything, any antibiotics. And I told her, I said, you know, I do have sickle cell disease, but I don't want my sickle cell to flare up because I'm running a fever and I have this upper respiratory infection. Two days later, my son, which is Deontay, he ran a fever. So I said, well, I haven't got to taste sick, not knowing at that time, you know, that I had COVID. And how high were your fevers? It was like 101.3 or 0.4 when I had it on the 12th. But the 14th is when I went to the hospital. It was 102.9. That's That's got to be awful. I know, you know, I have five kids and when one of them's just sick, I'm worried about them. If they're in the hospital, it's a big deal. And then to have them be in the hospital and you have to be in the hospital at the same time, I can't imagine the stress from that. It was very stressful. I remember it was late February before anybody even started talking about this COVID um, in the media. You know, there had been discussions of Wuhan coronavirus, but I think it was late February when it started to sink into everybody that it was going to come here and it was going to be a big deal. And I I think it wasn't until about the middle of March that we really, you know, started shutting things down and, and really thinking about this. At that point, did you realize what was going on? Did you realize you might have COVID? Was that a concern or you just thought, oh, my sickle cell's flaring up and I might have a pneumonia? Yeah, it really wasn't a big concern because I hadn't been anywhere. In January, I didn't hear too much about it, but I had the flu really, really bad. It was like the worst case of flu. But in March, I wouldn't have thought that I would have had COVID. 
I just thought maybe I was gotten sick because of the weather. So when did you find out that it was COVID? Well, they tested me the night of on the 14th when I first went, but the test came back like a positive negative type of thing. They had to retake it. And that's when the test came back on the 19th and said that I had, I, that I did have it. So what, what went through your mind when they told you that? Because I think at that point, we all kind of knew about COVID. It was scary. I didn't know what to think because I knew at that time I had to tell my kids. I had to let my family know. It was really scary because I was there alone. Um, I didn't have my family. I didn't have no friends. No one there to support me. And it was me. that because that they wouldn't let anybody in because you had the COVID? Yep. No one can be there. No one could be in a waiting room while I'm in the back in the emergency. No one could be there when I'm up in my room. No one can come visit. The only thing they can do is really call. Everyone who basically I was around, like my children, I had to let them know to go get retested. But they wouldn't test them, which I think they should. They were so restrictive about the testing and, and still are to some extent. Because they didn't have enough tests, they were saying, we'll only test people if they have a fever, or if they have all of these symptoms. And that's been a huge frustration for us because we, we don't know who has COVID and, and who doesn't and how do you isolate people. And um, I think that's been a challenge throughout all of this. But I can't imagine as a parent, you're stuck in the hospital and you're worrying about your kids and they can't get tested. Um, yeah. uh, uh, had to be awful. Um, that sounds so scary. So, so what were you able to do in the hospital? Were you just feeling miserable and sleeping or? Actually, I was, um, hospitalized three times. Um, the first hospitalization is when I was there on the 14th. You're just isolated in the room. The nurses come in, doctors may come in, mask, uh, one of those visor things, a full body suit as far as getting chest x-rays, EKGs, and everything that's done is done right there in your room. I did sleep a lot. My sickle cell was flared up, so I wasn't feeling good as far as, you know, that. And then I couldn't, my chest was hurting a lot. Basically, I just, they gave me medication and started, you know, antibiotics and tried to get rid of the pneumonia first. Were they able to treat you for the pain at that time? I was taking, you know, my, the medication far as for the sickle cell pain. They did give me medication for that. They gave me the antibiotics. They gave me two different types of antibiotics that hung up. I don't, can't remember what they were. One was Keflex or Keflex for the pneumonia. That's basically all they could really, you know, do but they didn't give me oxygen at the time um it was very uncomfortable my back was hurting really bad they would give me like heating pads or little heat packs to put on my back um, which didn't really work but it was still difficult for me to breathe so what they did was um you know gave me the medication said that my lungs were clear um, that they felt comfortable with me leaving, you know, on the 24th or the 25th or something like that when I left. So I came home. Two days later, I was back. Chest pains, real bad, back pain, shortness of breath. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't sleep for days. I can't imagine you're in the room. They won't let you out of the room. And then everybody comes in like you're contagious and scary to them. They're all in these gowns and yeah. gloves and you can't see people. Uh, to me, that sounds terrifying. When, when you were living through it, was it terrifying? It was. I think it was more or less scary because you don't know the unknown. You know, I don't know if I'm going to be okay. They're not really, they probably don't really know what's going on. Why am I back a second time? You know, it's like I'm away from my family. I'm seeing bodies getting being stretched away past me and it's it was it was 
it was scary, not knowing what was going on with me, not knowing if I was going to be okay, and I'm there by myself. Um, and the only thing I can call home and tell my kids and my family is if something happened to me, make sure they do everything they can to keep me alive. Oh, boy. Wow. So wow. I stayed in the hospital the second time for another four days, four or and five th days. That one, they gave you a transfusion? Um, the la Well, the third time when I went back. The second time, they gave me medication, more antibiotics to get rid of the chest thing, the um, hematologist called. And I was actually at a hospital where um, my medical records were not there. I had a bad experience on the 14th before I went, even went to this hospital, which was Beaumont, and I think they were very concerned. I went to my hospital, which was Henry Ford, and I got the worst treatment there. During my sickle cell pain, I asked for a wheelchair because I couldn't stand up. I said, ma'am, may, may I please get a wheelchair? I said, I have sickle cell disease. And the nurse just told me, I walked in there fine so I can wait for a wheelchair. And I said, well, ma'am, I didn't. After probably about almost an hour, I ended up getting back dressed because I got the worst treatment there and had to drive all the way back to Farmington Hills just to get treated. And I had pneumonia and fever of 102.9 and then ever since I've gotten sick it's really hard for me to sleep at night. I, unfortunately that's a story we hear all the time from um, our, our patients and, and warriors all over that they're just trying to get help and the people just don't don't treat them well um, so I'm I'm sorry that happened. So the third time that I went in, the night that I went back to the hospital, um, I couldn't breathe. My chest was hurting so bad. I was really weak. I had to call EMS to even, they did, my kids did get me from upstairs to downstairs to the stretcher um, because I couldn't, I couldn't walk. I couldn't hold my body up. It felt like something was just closing in on my throat. I couldn't, I didn't have no air to get in. So they took me back to the emergency room and I just didn't think that I was gonna make it. I told my kids to just make sure I stay alive, whatever it costs. Deontay was very worried. They both were. Um, he wanted to ride in the back of the EMS. They told him he couldn't. So that would make anyone worry. So when I got there to the hospital, they couldn't go in the back with me. And actually, they pulled me off the truck and took me into the tent and did another assessment before they take me into the hospital. The nurse that was attending to me, she was very insensitive. When I, I couldn't breathe as it was, I couldn't breathe, I couldn't really move. And she said that she had to retake my blood pressure and everything like that, which was fine. But she took my jacket and she pulled it so hard where it just made me just like, it's like I lost more air, you know? And I said, ma'am, you're being so insensitive. You know, you're, I can't breathe. I said, I'm hurting really, really bad, you know? I said, but that's really insensitive of how you're treating me. And the EMS guys looked at each other, you know, and looked at her, you know, and she said, I'm just scared. I said, well, I'm scared too, you know? I don't know if I'm gonna make it through the night. I said, well, ma'am, I cannot breathe. I said, can I get some oxygen or something? But the EMS man had the tube still in my nose from the oxygen, but she never even brought out a tank out or anything. So 
they took me and she just started crying. She just said, I'm just scared. I said, ma'am, I'm scared too. I said, I'm sorry, I don't mean to make you cry or anything, but you need to be a little bit more sensitive with people that come through here, regardless of you know how you're feeling. We feel just as bad because I have COVID and I've been dealing with this since March and she just cried. So were you able to keep in touch with your family through the phone and the Wi-Fi and uh, FaceTime? Yeah, I would call my family and let them know what's going on and everything like that. But I do really believe that if I didn't have the right state of mind that I had, I probably wouldn't be here to talk to you guys today. It's such an ordeal to go through. It takes a lot of strength to get through something like that, especially worrying about your kids and I can't, I can't even imagine. The third time when I went in, the hematologist told me, he asked me about the acute chest again. I told him, I don't know what acute chest is because I don't know if I ever had that because I don't know how acute chest felt. I, I took test after test, x-rays, um, CAT scans and everything. And they did say that I had acute chest and they were going to do a blood exchange. Did that help? Did you feel better after that? Yeah, I had 79% sickling in my body, which I feel that that was, that was a whole lot. And, and you're on hydroxyurea at home usually? No. No? All right, we need to work on that. My baseline hemoglobin is 10. Oh. 10, 10.1 or 10.2 or something. That's what my baseline hemoglobin is. Do you know what it was at during this? It was over 7.5. He said if it was any lower, then he would give me more blood because um, I did tell them before I left the hospital, I want more blood if it's going to help me. And he said that it does take about three days for your hemoglobin to go back up after the exchange. After I got the exchange to answer your question, maybe about an hour later, I felt a lot better. It was like pressure off of my chest. I could breathe a lot better, but I they, they did keep me on oxygen. And and then did things start going in the right direction after that? You look well today. I'm happy to say. <laughs> Thank. I feel a lot better. However, you know the pain that I had, like in my my back area, I still have a little bit. But my doctor says to be expected you know, because of what my body just went through. You know, I was retested and I think I sent you a text message and said that I was retested and my test came back negative, that I didn't have it in me anymore. My doctor did send me the things that I may still experience far as the cough because I did have the pneumonia. I did have that COVID. And it's just like a dry cough. So I, I have a question for you, Latoria. If sure. you could reach out to the warriors who are listening out there that don't know what to expect or maybe scared, maybe nervous, what would you what one major thing would you want them to know about this whole ordeal that you went through? What is what is like what is the one message you want to give them? It will be a combination of things. One, don't take it lightly. Anyone can get it. Anyone could be a carrier of it and pass it along. Like I said, I didn't know that I had it. I didn't know where I got it from. Not saying that, you know, the first thing we think of, and I think this is what my children, when I told them they were screaming, they were crying, you know, all they hear and all we hear is the negative part of it, you know, of how many people are not living from it. But you can, you have to be strong. You have to be aware of your body. You have to know what's going on with you. Had I not went the three times that I did, I may have not been here today to speak. But because I know my body and I know. I don't just wait and say, oh, I'll go tomorrow or I'll go, you know, I think it'll be okay. I'm, I am very keen on when it comes to my health and my son's health, 
always have been, but you have to know your body. You have to listen to what your body is telling you. That, that's really good advice. That's really good advice because you know, every sickle cell patient's a little bit different and you know your body better than any other doctor out there. And you're proactive and you advocate for yourself. I'm sorry you went through this horrible month long illness, but I think at the end of it, it is an uplifting story. You made it, you made it through, you're better. You, yeah. you beat COVID. And I think, and I thank everyone at Beaumont, all of the doctors there that, you know, the hematologists, the infectious disease, uh, medical doctor, my nurses. I thank all of them. I just, you know, thank God, you know, because I, I was really scared. I was on the phone with my my friend and I said, you know, I'm really, really scared. And I just start crying. I'm like, I'm scared because you don't know what's going to go on. You don't know, you know, so many people are are there for the same thing and not making it through or have to be intubated, you know. And I'm glad that I didn't have to be. I'm glad I was, you know, I didn't let it get me down. And I mean, it did, but it didn't. I, I was. You didn't let it beat you. I didn't let the nurses do too much for me. I got up and I got up. I walked around. I used the the thing you breathe in. What is the, the sp incentive spirometer? Yeah, the spirometer. I used that, you know, just to, you know, to, it hurts really, really bad but you got to do something for yourself. You can't let them do everything for you. You have to be a fighter for yourself, you know, because you're there by yourself. You don't have no family. You don't have any, you know, someone who really knows you like you know you. You don't have them there. You know, I slept on the couch since I've been home. I just went and laid in my bed the other night for the first time I've been home because I was scared. It's a mental thing. And for sure, you know, I, do I need therapy? I think I may need therapy because it plays with your mind. I've been through a lot. Yeah. And especially with all of the, the coverage on the media. I don't even watch that anymore. I don't watch it. If they come across my phone, I just delete it. I watch movies all day or if the news is on, I'll cut it off. It's a mind thing, you know, and to be in a hospital and see the bodies go past you, it, it's scary. We've known that you're a, a warrior, but, but now you're, you're a survivor too. Yes. Yep, I am. And I'm trying to stay this way. You know, the only, my only biggest concern is I don't want to have, I don't want to catch it again. I don't want my kids to catch it. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I think that was was really a great insight into what it's like going through all of all of COVID. And I, I hope our warriors get a lot out of your story. I think to hear, you know, how how you came down with symptoms, to hear all of the challenges and dealing with it, um, but also to hear that you can beat it and you can get home. And uh, thank you so much. You can. Thank you. I appreciate you guys so very much. All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in for this special mini episode going over a warrior story with coronavirus. Dr. Callahan, thank you so much for helping us get through this one. Thank you. And thanks so much to Latoria Brown for joining us today and sharing her story with us. I think it was a really powerful story. It's a scary time but it's nice to see that someone can get through it. And don't forget, share this podcast with someone you think could learn about sickle cell disease or coronavirus even. Follow me at Dr. Z Sickle Cell and follow Dr. C at... At Imagineer. All right, guys, stay safe. Keep living well with sickle cell. Thanks, everybody.